Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the show today. And I am super excited to have you here with us as we learn about FIRE or the financial term of FIRE. So, hey, guys, my name is Dustin Heiner with Master Passive Income and Successfully Unemployed. And I am here to show you how you can quit that J-O-B, that just overbroke job by investing in real estate, by having businesses and passive income and everything else. And there is an actual way that you could become financially independent and retire early, like not wait until you're 65 or 70 years old when your life is basically done to eventually retire. No, we want to quit our job earlier, stop living just over broke and actually be financially independent. Now, today I have an author on. He's actually a good friend of mine. We're in a mastermind together. A mastermind, we get four of us other guys, really, really good businessmen working together, helping us to have better family lives, you know, treating our spouses well, as well as doing better in our businesses. And this gentleman has already sold a business in the past. He's done really well in real estate, as well as also coaching people how to be financially free and be on fire, which we'll get into in just a second. I have my good friend Michael Kwan here on the show. Michael, thanks a lot for being here on the show. I'm glad to have you. Hey, Dustin. Thanks so much for having me back. And it's it's great to be on your show. For those of you listening, you know, of course, Dustin has done amazing things with real estate. And fire really is all about the same core fundamentals, right? Getting that financial independence, getting that cash flow so that you can quit that J-O-B that Dustin's always telling you about. I love it. And Thinking about how you have actually caught on fire, well, let's let's talk about that. Now, you and I have talked a lot about this before in the past, over and over again at length, that the term fire is something that you really have to explain because most people either don't know it or don't really get it. So let us understand what does fire, when it comes to financial freedom, financial independence, all that sort of stuff, like financially, what does it mean by being on fire? That's a great question, Dustin. And and here's the funny thing. When I retired early from my nine to five career when I was 36, there was no term out there that I could find. I, I just thought that I had retired early and um, done something interesting. But it turns out that over the course of blogging, I'm a blogger as well, I learned that there was a term that's actually associated with this, and it stands for financial independence, retire early. And what was fascinating was that there was a number of different people that have come in and actually made it very popular in the personal finance space. So for people that are actually in there learning about personal finances, all of a sudden this term fire kind of took some steam and people started saying like, you know what? I don't have to work that J-O-B anymore. I can actually start building some passive income and I can really manage my expenses so that I'm not bound by a traditional career. And so that's where I get really excited and passionate about it is because like you, you know, life is, I think, meant to be lived to create impact and, and make relationships and share and really find our true authentic selves. And I think it's hard to do when we're stuck in that J-O-B, right? When you're working for money, then you're coming from that area of scarcity. And, and I really want people to know that there's another way, there's another path. So that's why I'm so excited to kind of bring this book out this, at this time. It's called The Fire Planner, and what it does is it really walks you through what the fire essentially is, the whole concept, and how it came to, came to be with these different personalities like Mr. Money Mustache. Um, he's someone that's in there that has really, I think, resonated with people thus far as far as, hey, you know what? Let's be mindful of our money. Let's not spend money on things that don't really matter. You know, how much money are you spending every single month on a car? How much money are you spending every single month on rent and all of these other items that you actually have a lot of control over, but we get enamored in society with what we're supposed to have. So FIRE is financially independent and retire early, all combined as an acronym for all that. Now, is it necessary that you have to be a millionaire in order to achieve fire or how does what's what's the I guess the gauge or the criteria to actually say you know what I've achieved fire yeah great question so l- let me break it down a little bit for you so because it's an acronym and it stands for financial independence retire early let's take the first part which is the FI the FI so financial independence is actually referring to when you have enough passive income to cover your daily expenses And so, you know, it's really a relative number because if you spend $30,000 a year 
all of a sudden you don't need that much money to retire early on. However, if you have $100,000 every single year that you're spending on, then your fire number is going to be a little bit higher. So the quick rule of thumb is to really multiply your annual expenses by 25 to figure out what that financial in financial independence number is, that fine number is what we like to call it. So in that example, we could take $100,000 and, you know, say if you're living large, right? $100,000 a year is a lot of money to spend every year, but some people that's that's the lifestyle they want to live. For them, if you multiply that by 25, then all of a sudden you're going to come to the number of $2.5 million. So in that case, yeah, you're going to need multiple millions of dollars. But guess what? Not everyone needs that much money. And what's interesting is that Mr. Money Mustache said, you know what? I'm living on $30,000 a year. I don't have a car. I bike to work. I go out and walking. I do all these things that are not necessarily, you know, traditional societal norms, but I'm happy. It, it makes me happy. I'm fulfilled. And these are the things that I'm doing. And I don't spend a lot of money. Guess what? All of a sudden, I can retire on this, this other number, which is $750,000. So in that case, do you need a million dollars? Nope, you don't. So truth is, most people are somewhere in, in between that. Um, you know, some are f further on the extreme and others are you know further out. And I think for you and myself, that's where real estate is really exciting, right? Because with real estate, it's really a place where you can create some of that passive income and that cash flow that can make that fire number really start working for you immediately. So when I started really thinking about never having to work a job again, I was thinking only thing I really wanted to do was not work for somebody else. If I had another business, if I had investments, whatever it might be, I just really didn't want to work for somebody else because of um, I wanted to have the freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I wanted to. Not saying I wouldn't work because I love being busy. I love working. I love uh, providing for my family. I love doing that, but I just got tired of working for somebody else. So my, I guess, way to get to fire wasn't necessarily, let's, let's say if it was a hundred thousand dollars a year, which I, we definitely don't spend that. We're very frugal. We're maybe, I don't know, 30, $40,000 a year. We own our house or we own our car. So we just don't have that many expenses, but let's just say it's a hundred thousand and you have to get to $2.5 million. Well, I looked at it a little differently and tell me if, if this is a, a good way to also look at it was I said, I have my expenses. Let's say with the mortgage and everything, it was $4,000 a month total. That's like everything. That's food. That's uh, emergency fund. That's uh, saving for a vacation. That was $4,000 total every single month that we had to, to pay. That's, you know, that's only 40, was that $4,800? Um, sorry, $48,000 a year in expenses that I had. So with $4,000 a month, I thought, you know what I need? I need as many rental properties as it takes to cover that $4,000 a month. And so it took me, I want to say it's about six years. And I had at least, uh, I think it was like 19 or 20 properties. And it was bringing in close to $10,000 a month. Now, after all the expenses, it was like $6,500. So I was definitely, you know, I was profiting by $2,500 a month with all of my properties. And so that was how I became financially independent because I kept buying property after property. And I said, no matter what, even if I stop working, even if like the stock market crashes or whatever, I'm still going to make money. Is is that an also another way to do, instead of like, the, you know, the multiply by 25, yeah. what are your thoughts about this type of, you know, let me just cover my expenses with businesses or passive income? Certainly. And that's a great question. And let me take a quick step back. I should have probably prefaced this to say that this 25 multiple that I was talking about, this is based on what's called a safe withdrawal rate. So meaning that you multiply your expenses by 25, this gives you a number that is ideally in a passive income type of vehicle, which could be investments. And so the reason why they use 25, it's called the rule 25, is that they did some it's, I think it was called the Trinity study about 30 years ago. And they said basically, okay, what happens if you put your money away and you start withdrawing it over time? What's that magic number where, you know, you can pull from it, but it's not going to actually deplete all of your assets from the stock portfolio. Because ultimately, once you start having a large enough asset base in your stocks, then you're going to get dividends, you're going to get, you know, some growth. And so, What's that ideal level where you can kind of skim off the top, right? But still keep that principle intact and retire, you know, for 30, 40 years. And so what they came to the understanding was about 4% was this ideal number. So they call it the safe withdrawal rate. Now, 
taking that 4% number, some people did a bunch of math and said, you know what, here's a really quick way to get back and figure out what this ideal number is. And here it is. It's this 25 multiple that you can just take, multiply that by your annual expenses, and it'll give you that fire number. So now what you're talking about, though, is really getting to the heart of the cash flow. And that's what I actually love, because with real estate, you can actually bypass that and then sometimes accelerate it much faster than building up a base of assets in a stock portfolio. And so for me, you know, I like I like doing both. I have the assets in the stock market, but I also have a lot of assets in real estate. And to be honest, real estate is something that I think grows faster. You have more control over and it gives you more leverage. So that's why I like using, you know, a combination of those plus entrepreneurship. That's one of the other ones. In the, inside the book, I really talk about three fire accelerators that people can focus on. Now, of course, you're going to also have to make sure that you're frugal enough, like Dustin, right, to make sure that you're not spending more <laughs> than you actually make. However, I'd rather you focus on your income generation than your expense reduction because expense reduction is finite at a certain point, but income generation it's unlimited. I mean, we, we talk about that, you know, every month, Dustin, we talk about how to increase that income and how to, you know, get that to the next level so that we can make more impact. Yeah. And when you're thinking about yourself, your own journey, because you mentioned that you dabbled it or you, you do have stocks, you have real estate and you have businesses. Talk to us a little about your journey and how you got to be where you are now, where, and I would absolutely say and vouch for you, for everybody listening, Michael Kwan is absolutely uh, verifiably uh, able to write this book because he has done it and done it very, very good job. So talk to us about your journey, how you got to where you are, that you can successfully write a book that teaches people, showing people how to exactly do this too. Sure, absolutely. And I want to preface this by saying that I really wrote this book because it's the book that I wish I had when I was kind of starting out on that journey. And it's a book that I want to be accessible to anyone. I want anyone to be able to pick up this book and be like, you know what? This is interesting. Never heard of this term before. This is actually something I can do. Look, there's actually a roadmap to do this. And you know what? I can do that. And I, I got to tell you, you know, I definitely had some privilege growing up in that I had a couple of uncles that had actually retired early. And even though my own parents weren't retired early and, you know, we're probably lower to middle class growing up in my family, I looked at my uncles and I was like, why do they never work? They're always out there like washing the car, like hanging out with their kids, taking them to school. And I'm like, that's not fair. How come my parents are working and they're never home when I go? They're never home when I get back from school and, you know, things of that nature. And it put the thought into my head, hey, there's a different way I can potentially do things. And so that really kind of planted the seed in my head that financial independence was possible, even though I didn't know what the term was at the time. And so once I got out of college, I went and I, and I got the J-O-B actually, because I didn't know what else to do at that time. And it was, uh, I, I went into IT because I was a computer gamer and I didn't know anything else. <laughs> Ironically, I had an economics degree, but I'm like, what am I going to do with that? No one was hiring at the time for economics degrees, but they were hiring for technology. So I got a job and I was you know, kind of happy. I was like, oh, look, I'm getting a salary now. And here's the interesting thing. I was actually starting to get enamored in this whole you know, kind of salary thing. And so part of my original mindset of like trying to reach financial independence kind of went out the window because I was like, oh, look, all the cool things I can have right now and started, you know, trying to buy the car and and do all these, you know, I don't want to say silly things, but things that society tells us to do. And the fortunate thing, I mean, unfortunate in the circumstances that led up to it. But what happened was that I was a year into working at this job and 9-11 hit. And the company that I was working for, we had an office in New York and L.A. and San Diego and San Diego is where I was based. You know, it was tough times for everyone, of course, in the economy and the economy got smashed. My company was no different and it started imploding. They started laying off people, you know, left and right. And in IT, my, unfortunately, my job was to go in and actually cancel out people's accounts. So like when they went into the meetings and they said, sorry, we can't have you here anymore. There's no more cash flow to support you. I was the one that was sitting in my office disabling their accounts because Ouch. they didn't know how they were going to react. Probably some of your friends it, too. It was terrible. It was, no, it was totally my friends. My friend Ark, my friend Jen, like literally they were my friends that were sitting in this meeting and then I'm getting instructions to disable their stuff, lock them out. And then 
when I say goodbye, I mean, it's so awkward because it's like, I just, I just disable your account. What do I say? And, and just the look on their face, right. Of not knowing where the next paycheck was going to come from that uncertainty. And some of that uncertainty that I, that I know some of you have felt this last year during the COVID times, right. Some of you didn't know where your next paycheck was going to come from. Some of you didn't know, you know, you didn't have the security of that J O B. And so that was the unfortunate circumstance. But what came out of that situation was that I was facing the layoff myself too. After the sixth round, I was like, you know what? Do I really want to stick around anymore? And I was like, no, I don't. So I grabbed a friend, Mike and Brett, and I pulled him into my office and I said, you know what? Do we want to really stick around for round seven? We can see where this is going. Let's go do our own thing. And that's exactly what we did. We started our own IT support and services company and we just grinded. We grinded hard. We got on our hands and knees. We plugged in cables. We were like, you know, serving the customer at the base level needs. But slowly over time, we really built up this company over the course of 10 years, started adding employees. We ended up buying a couple of smaller companies. And by the end of it, we had a national, you know, presence and we were able to sell that company to another company. And that was really, I think, the point where I said, you know what? This is interesting. I actually have some flexibility now. Let me go ahead and use some of these assets that I just got from the sale of the business and let me plunk it down into real estate. And so that's where I bought my first couple of cash flowing properties. And when I finally, the dust settled from all the sale of the company, I worked for them like a year and a half or so, eventually left. I was like, you know what? I actually have the flexibility to do whatever I want. You know, as Dustin said, I was successfully unemployed. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) And and it was phenomenal. It is fantastic. And I really got to spend the last six to seven years at home with my kids being present. And something that I really cherish dearly because with my own mom, she was very hardworking. She was a single mom. They got my parents got divorced when I was about 12. And she worked so hard and didn't have a ton of time, you know, to always spend with us. But I knew that she loved and cared for us. And so I really wanted to take that time with my own kids and have that connection. And so that's something that fire really gives you. It gives you options in life. It gives you the ability to do something different than what society tells us we have to do. We have to go out. We have to get the good job. We have to get the right compensation. We have to drive the right car. We have to have the right house. But what about our family? What about ourselves? What about our true passions and our dreams that we had originally that somehow get lost along the path of normalcy, right? By societal standards. So that's what really kind of brought me to the place of fire. And then after that, it was really exploring, well, what does this mean? You know, part of it was going out there blogging, meeting incredible people like you that have done similar things in in a different fashion and learning from you, learning from other people, learning how to do online businesses. And then ultimately the book came about because I wanted to serve more people. I wanted to say, you know what? I had this incredible privilege. I had these incredible opportunities that came into my life. How can I then pass this on? And I thought, hey, you know what? A book is a great way to pass this along, be part of that you know, wealth legacy that I can leave for my kids and for other people that are on a similar path and looking to do something different. And for everybody watching this on YouTube or listening to it, you can actually check out Michael has his website, financialalert.com. And in that, he actually posts his um, uh, financial statement and everything. Do, do you still do that? Because I remember you were doing that quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I first started blogging, one of the interesting things was a lot of people were anonymous. And, you know, I kind of wanted to put a face to the blog because I'm like, uh, it seems a little bit more genuine to me, at least. That was my feeling. Um, but there's a lot of bloggers that were out there and then they were sharing numbers. They were like, you know, this is the net worth. This is the cash flow. And I was like, you know what? I actually like that because I'm a details guy. I like to see what the numbers are. And someone says, oh, well, I did all this. I'm like, okay, well, what's what's the verification? What, what are you talking about? And so I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll go out there and share. And I kind of explained it to my wife. She's like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, I do um, and I was like, well, I think it'll help people. And I think people will really get some value from seeing how the cash flow is working. And what's interesting is that in that process of doing that and sharing those numbers, I learned a ton about what I was doing versus what I could have been doing and where ultimately I'm evolving to. One of the things that I've realized in that process of sharing out for the last, I think it's been four years now, Dustin, is I started sharing out when we had a net worth of about maybe like one and a half million or something. And over the last you know, four years or whatnot, 
there's been different events, right? So real estate transactions, um, investments that have started to grow and, you know, very blessed, but, you know, over time it's, it's increased by like another seven figures just because of, you know, inflation and, and all these other elements and some good timing of assets um, and investments that I've made. And I wanted to share that journey and I wanted to share why I was doing specific things, why I was taking equity from one of the properties most recently and putting it to something else because there was a bunch of debt equity in one of my properties that I thought was actually a good real estate investment and then it wasn't. And so, you know, blogging really gave me that outlet to, to even express that to myself and then conversing with you, you know, we really kind of got to realize, okay, well, let's make a move here. And then when I made the move, I mean, I went to people like you, experts like Dustin. And I was like, you know what, how do I sell this myself? So I don't have to pay the, <laughs> the real estate agent that's just sitting out there handing out these silly flyers. I can do that myself. I'm fired. So I've got the time. And I did exactly that. You helped me to save, I think somewhere upwards of like $30,000 on this, this last sale. So yeah. And that was a property in San Diego that you owned. And as we were talking about it, I'm like, man, if you took that money that you had there, deploy it in other places, because right now it, you're, you're limited how much you can make there just because of rents. But the, the worth of that house is so much more. If we sold it, we could possibly refinance and pull that cash out and do something with that. But we looked and you decided what's best for your family, sell it and then deploy it. And that was great when you were able to sell that property and then not have to pay a realtor fee on your end, you know, being the seller's realtor. Oh, my goodness. That's that's a lot of money. Now, you did mention that as we're going to the idea of fire, you know, we may just say the person listening to this might be working that dead end J-O-B and trying as hard as they can, but they're they're probably not going to go anywhere. Their bosses are either there's no room to grow or whatever it might be, but they're thinking, I do want financial independence. I'd love to retire early. Now, I personally did the real estate. I love real estate. Other people have done it through stocks. Other people have started businesses. So many different other routes to go, but you talk about inside your book, the, uh, the, the fire starting as well as the three things that, that really help you in the fire journey. Can you walk over some of those with us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the three things that you're mentioning are what I like to call the fire accelerators. And again, it goes back to the premise that we can really have unlimited income. So if we focus more time on that, then all of a sudden our journey to fire becomes that much easier, right? It's very hard to save into fire. Can, it can it be done. Yes. You might be miserable eating beans and, <laughs> and cheese and tortillas every single day can be done. Um, and if that's, that's your thing. There's no, there's no judgment in that space. However, if you want to do something that's, you know, in line with your current, you know, state of living, or maybe you just want to tailor it back a little bit and then add on, I think there's a real opportunity for most people. And I go through the book, I talk about, okay, how do you use these three different elements? First and foremost is the fundamentals of saving and investing, right? No matter how much money you make, you're always going to have to save more than you're putting out. Otherwise, you're always going to be the negative, right? Mike Tyson made hundreds of millions of dollars. He went bankrupt, right? Same thing with Evander Holyfield, MC Hammer, all these, these great public figures, but they didn't have the financial education to be able to manage that money and keep it, right? So first and foremost, you have to get some of those fundamentals in place, right? We've got to get you out of consumer debt. We've got to get you investing every single month in saving and, and do it aggressively in some sense. And one of the things I talk about in the book is this idea of raise laddering. And what that is, is that, you know, if you do have the J-O-B, I'm not saying to go out, quit it and start a business or start just buying real estate. Stick with the job, but start getting entrepreneurial within the job. I talk about a concept called entrepreneurship. So going in and asking your company, how can you be more valuable are there other specific projects that you can be a part of that can pay out a bonus that is tied to a metric of success? And then all of a sudden you're more invested. So you can add on potentially more bonuses. And on top of that, you know, some people might get a raise every single year just by default, maybe two to three percent. I talk about going out and asking it before then. You know, as a former business owner myself, I gotta tell you, some of my best employees never came in and asked me for that raise. And if they did, I would have gladly handed it to them. Of course, I would hand it to them proactively myself. But had they done that even like six months or a year earlier, I probably would have said yes anyways. 
So if you're doing a great job, go in there, ask for the raise. And when you get that raise, spend some of it, not all of it, some of it, maybe just to celebrate, right? And then after you spend some of that, start socking it away using auto deductions through your 401k. Maybe you have a specific account that you can set aside to automatically push money into an account set aside for real estate. That's another place you can put it. And really use that that raise event to kind of set a new standard for yourself, right? Increase your, your state of living a little bit, but at the same time, start saving that much more, right? If you just got like a $5,000 raise, and you, you know, just basically spent a thousand of it for fun, celebrating, whatever, that's great. And you socked away 4,000. Fantastic, right? I mean, that's $4,000 into that new account that can ultimately be a property as, you know, we'll probably talk about later. So that's one area. Entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. That's a great way. Saving and investing. That's another great way. And of course, you know, the third one is real estate investing. That's one that, you know, you and I always talk about. We always get excited because real estate, it's something that you can really go out there and it's something tangible that will keep up with inflation and something that you can touch, you can leverage, but you got to do the work. So, you know, definitely go talk to Dustin and get into his course, learn the fundamentals of real estate investing. The I think you know, there's something like 90% of millionaires have touched real estate in some form or fashion. So it's this is not like a this is not a fad. It's not going away. And I think in some regards, it's probably one of the easier ways to become a millionaire or to create that cash flow. So for me, I like to do passive investing and not really try to figure out you know what the next best flyer is. I used to do that, but now I've decided you know what. Let's not do that anymore. Let's do passive investing where you're putting your money into an index fund, letting the market kind of just take it for a ride over time and compounding. And then let me take the rest of my time and focus on real estate. And so most recently, I'm focusing on a short-term real estate investment here in Las Vegas. And when you say that, I mean like Airbnb, VRBO type of short-term le- exactly. leasing. Yes. Awesome. Exactly. Yeah. And so there are a lot of different ways to actually invest your money for future so, so be 401k, be your mutual funds, be actual stocks, um, real estate. There's so many different ways that you can actually do, do that. But at the same time, it's I personally, I definitely want to hit on that the starting of a business is something that is, it, it really is different, in my opinion, than like, say, buying a stock. You know, anybody can buy a stock. It literally, anybody, you get on Robinhood and you can absolutely buy a stock. I mean, GameStop showed us that that's actually possible for anybody to do that. But think about starting a business now. And you've started many businesses. You've actually sold one, which was fantastic, being able to have that exit strategy to be able to get out of a business. Now, when you're thinking about a business that you're going to start to help you to increase the amount of money you can invest or save, what what go through, goes through your head as you're starting a business? You know, and there's a couple different ways to start a business, right? There's the, there's the method where you go out and you self-fund it. And then there's the other method where you're going out and raising capital and having someone else fund it. Personally, I like the first method because then you have full control. You're not having to answer to anybody specifically. And unless you're like, you know, holding on to some great patent or something that you can ultimately sell to like an investor, I think it's hard to come in with an idea. I mean, ideas are a dime a dozen, right? Go on and listen to Shark Tank. They'll you'll see you'll see Kevin O'Leary, right? Telling me ideas are a dime a dozen, right? I don't care about the idea. I care about the implementation. I care about the raw numbers and is the market responding? So I think if you're going to go out and start a business, you want to first start with the idea, right? And then you want to test. You want to put it out in the market and see if anyone's going to be willing to buy it. Because if they aren't, you should probably pivot before you even get started. It's very easy to get caught up in the building portion of a business before you get started with the revenue generation parts of it. And you will absolutely, if you do this and you start talking to your friends and family and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of this business idea. What do you think about this? Everybody, literally everybody's going to say, unless they're brutally honest and they're like, hey, I really want to help you out. Everybody else would say, oh, man, it's a great idea. You should run with it. But then as soon as you say, okay, how about you pay me right now for this business? They'll be like, ah, uh, uh, I don't know. It's a little tight right now. So they'll want to pat you on the back and say, good job. Go for it. Somebody else will pay you. But why not you? Why aren't you putting out, you know, bringing out your credit card? Well, 
it probably could be that it's not the best business model. I'm not saying it isn't, but you cannot go, in my opinion, you can't go off of friends and family. You have to go off. If there's a market for it, people are going to pay you for it. So you need to also figure out, are people going to actually pay you for it? So um, as you're building that business, what, what, so let's say we have something that people are starting to pay us for. Is there anything that we should do in the business that helps us to look at the fire as being the ultimate goal? Like, is it the strategy of selling it and getting out or hiring people so that it runs on its own? What are your thoughts about the fire part of the business aspect? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit different, but I'm going to speak to those of you that, you know, might have a job right now, right? Where you are getting a, you know, recurring salary every, every month and you have some extra time. And so for a lot of people on the journey to fire, I say, go out there and start a side hustle. Start putting out something into the market, whether it's a service, whether it's a product, and start trying to make you know an extra couple thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars there, and see if it takes. And if it takes, then you start doing more of it. You start building processes around that and trying to generate more revenues and then funneling that back into the business to create better processes and then ultimately hiring people to to help you run that essentially, right? And so in our space, Dustin, we're very fortunate in that we get to talk to a number of different online entrepreneurs and some that have done very well for themselves, right? And sometimes, you know, they never intended this to happen. They just went out and they started doing it. So I think if there's one thing that I want to share with you guys is just go out there and start doing it. And you're going to get a result one way or another. Most likely it'll be a negative result, meaning that it's going to not work. And that's okay because that's fine. We do it 10 times, right? And guess what? All you need is one to catch. And once you get that one to catch, you keep running with it and you keep tweaking it until you get to that point where, you know what? All of a sudden, this looks very lucrative. And you know what? Maybe this J-O-B is not my focus anymore because look, I saved all this money here. It's generating revenues. You know what? I'm going to focus on this full time. And we know tons of people that have done exactly that. They transition out of that J-O-B and they become their own individual companies, and they go on to expand and ultimately even selling the companies. So that's one strategy, right, that you can always take. Or for some of you, it could be just a side hustle that you know, you're spending some extra time over the weekend to provide a service, and you get an extra $1,000 a month. Well, guess what? $1,000 extra a month is a lot of money that you can apply to something like real estate. And all of a sudden, you know, you're off to the races. So there's lots of different ways to do it. But but I think my main recommendation is if you're really thinking and you have the fire mindset, it's that you want to be able to generate some income and give yourself options. And the beautiful thing is, and as you are definitely a testament to, once you achieve fire, once you're able to stop working that J-O-B, you are obviously financially well off, but then you have more time to start even more businesses. Like you and I have time to as opportunities come up, we can take advantage of those opportunities because we have the time, we have the capital or the money to be able to jump on those opportunities as opposed to somebody who's starting out. Now, when you're starting out, you're grinding, you're hustling, you're working very, very hard. I worked very, very hard. Like for 10 years, I worked my tail off, not taking any vacations, eating top ramen. That, that's, that's, that was our go-to meal. And the, as a family of four, we were just sacrificing, sacrificing and sacrifice because I knew in the future life would be amazing. And for the past, what, four or five years now, I literally have not had a job and I will never need another job because I have so many businesses that provide us income as well as we keep our expenses really low, which is a huge blessing. Now, Michael, what are the other accelerators or anything else that we need to know as we are getting that fire really started? Yeah. You know, what I really like to talk about is, you know, the strategies are great. And of course, there's different ways that you can really position yourself to accelerate. One of the areas though that I don't really see a lot of focus on that I'd love to share is really getting in the right mindset. And what I mean by that is taking the time in the beginning before even going on this journey to understand what does this journey mean to you? What's that ultimate end goal that you're looking for? And for you, you got very clear on what that end goal looked like, right? You knew that you wanted to- Quitting that job, charity, yes. Quitting that job. And you knew specifically you wanted to spend more quality time with your family. And so- you really need to figure out what that why is first. And that's why in my book, I really kind of put you through a number of exercises to really flesh out those old limiting money beliefs that we all inherently have potentially and, you know, deal with them, 
strike them out or realize that they're there and work around them. Because if we don't do that, then it's very difficult to go on this journey and have the extra fuel you need to push through when the times get tough. Because times will inevitably get tough. This is a this is a marathon and not just a sprint. And once you find that why, that driving reason why you're doing this, all of a sudden you get very clear. You get clear on what you should be working on, what you're not supposed to be working on. And it's no longer a question of like, you know, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. You know what to do. And it actually makes life a lot easier. I think. Let me ask you, Dustin, like, you know, when you kind of figured it out, like, did you just kind of know and you just kind of were like a laser beam that just kind of went at it? I mean, you, you must have because you did it in such a short amount of time and you started buying property after property after property. And it's amazing what we can really accomplish when we finally make that decision. Well, for me, it really came out of I'm in generally an entrepreneurial type of personality. I love that. But real estate was like my fifth or sixth business that I started. I had a graphic website design company, a skateboard manufacturing business, a pizzeria, a comedian store, a bunch of other businesses that I was starting. But the easiest one that made me the most money that I literally don't do anything in is real estate. And so what you don't see is all the other businesses and the hustling. I mean, buying and selling things on eBay, buying things someplace else, selling it on eBay because I can make some money. I was doing literally everything and anything I could to make money. But as I was realizing real estate was literally, I don't do much, if not anything at all, and I make money, I started winding down all these other businesses and putting all my effort into real estate. Now, you know what, 15, 20 years later, I have enough properties where I literally don't need to work. And so it took that mind shift, mindset shift, like you talked about, where I said, you know what, no longer am I going to be an employee where I trade an hour for a dollar or however many dollars that you make. Stop trading time for money. Instead, get paid for the value that I bring. Like if I buy a house, that's a huge value that I brought to buying the house, providing somebody a great place to live in at a decent price for rent. And I make money, I'm serving them, I'm blessing them. Same thing with Master Passive Income, Successfully Unemployed, just serving more people. And I found that out of all my businesses, the best way to make more money is to serve more people. The more people that you can serve, the more money that you'll make, the better you'll feel in general. Like I love it when my students say, hey, Dustin, I bought my first rental property. After coaching them, they bought their first rental property or even much more so when they have enough properties to quit their job. So being able to serve more people is really by far the best, but it did, it does, you can't see all the stuff that I did for 20 years before to get to the point where I'm at. But it really took, like you said, that mindset to realize that I can do it. There are so many people that have done it in the past. Why can't I? And in fact, all the other limitations, like when I was started investing in real estate, I heard so many people say, oh, you should not get into real estate. Uh, you know, my uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins, former roommate had a real estate property and their tenants destroyed the property. So you shouldn't do it. And they start putting all their own limitations on you, trying to convince mm -hmm. you. It's like somebody that's trying to hold you back because they are being held back because they want company with them. They want to be reaffirmed in their thought that real estate's bad. Well, I broke through that because my mindset was like, no more. I'm not going to let other people's limitations be put on me. And I'm not going to let any limitations stop me. And then I kept investing. That's how I did it. And it, but it took time. It takes work. And at the same time, Michael, I think your fire planner is something that is, if I would have had this when I first got started, I would be light years above and beyond where I'm at now. So I'm really, really glad that this planner, this fire planner has come out. Now, talk to us about how the flow of the planner book is because it really walks somebody through, not just teach him the principles like, hey, this, you know, this is the thinking, this is the idea. No, it literally walks you through the process, correct? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, the fire planner, I'll show you really quick. You know, it's right here. It's a, uh, you can find it online. It's going to be dropping on May 4th, but I really designed it so that it's an interactive type of a book. So that means that you can see there's like worksheets and there's like active like elements and it's, you can see it's like it's broken down into bite-sized chunks because I think a lot of times with personal finance, it can be overwhelming, right? We get in there and you see all these numbers and you're like, well, I don't want to deal with this. I just came back from a long day of work. I want to just go turn on the TV or go to YouTube and watch some TikTok, whatever it is. We don't want to think about that. But with the fire planner, it's something that you can open up. You can learn a concept, right? And then you can dig deeper. 
It's also something where you can start journaling and being interactive. And what I love about that kind of design is that when you start writing something down, it engages your brain on a different level. It really starts to solidify the information. And ultimately, my whole premise of that is that I want you to take that and then translate that into action outside of the book, right? Start doing what it takes to, to get your finances or paying off that debt, starting to put aside and automate some of those savings and investings, starting to do the little things that will make incremental differences that will add up to huge volumes of results at the end. It's, it's like you said, you know, in the beginning, there's so many things that happen. And once you kind of get to that point where, you know, you're at the so-called success stage, no one ever looks back and says, oh, look at all those other things that he did before. And he had to step over all those different things. I'll share with you. There was one real estate investor that I know very well. You know, he went out on his first property. He was so excited. He had waited, I think, four or five years to buy his first property because he was like so anal. And he was like, I got to get this right. I got to get the perfect property. It has to cash flow, you know, $300 a month. It has to have the perfect, you know, three bedrooms, two baths, square footage. And he finally found this one gem of a property. And he was like so excited. He's like, yes, this is like the best thing ever. I finally did it. I waited. This is what I was waiting for, right? These last five years. He went in. He actually made an offer against like 10 other people, got the property because he had bid over maybe like 10000 I think, over the asking price. Got the property and was just like, yes, I've, I've got it. I've, I've done it. I'm going to start collecting that cash flow and all these cool things are going to happen. I'm, I'm a legitimate real estate investor now. And, and this guy basically started contacting property managers. And one of the property managers said to him, hey, did you know that the complex that you're in, this, this, this I think it's a, called a PDU, a planned urban development, this community with this HOA doesn't actually allow rentals. Like literally does not allow rentals. And he was just like, what the freak? Are you kidding me? And so talk about a bad first investment, right? And a terrible income property that couldn't produce income. That's You can't even call it rental property. It's just a property <laughs> at that point. And he already signed on the dot. He was already paying the mortgage. Um, I think most people in that situation would just throw their hands up and be like, well, screw this. This is like the stupidest thing ever. Real estate, burn me, forget it, I'm out. And I mean, this guy was, I got to tell you, he was kind of dumb for doing that. But here's the good thing. This guy actually was smart because his numbers actually were fundamentally sound. He actually decided to take those same exact numbers, ran the same exact analysis, bought a property across the street three or four months later in a different HOA community where, of course, he verified that he could actually pick up, you know, rental income from that HOA and he could. And now he holds that property. That property is like doubled, almost even tripled in equity and paid him cash flow for the last 10 years. And this silly, crazy investor doesn't, that's, that's, <laughs> that's me. That's me. I'm the idiot that, <laughs> that went into this deal. <laughs> And bought my first rental property that, that you could not basically I rent. Not they were, rent. were forbidden from renting, but you pushed through it. Yes, yes. I mean, you knew. I did. I did. Yeah, you knew that the business model was right. It was just a hang up that, hey, we all learn, you know, as we go through life. We're going to be learning. Now, it's, it also helps if you have like a mentor or a coach, uh, somebody that's walking you literally through the process and said, hey, watch out for this or watch out yes. for that. If you were there, then that would have <laughs> never happened. <laughs> At the time, <laughs> there's been a lot of landmines. But you're right. You that, have, to have the mindset. Yeah, there's been a lot of landlines. Yeah, you have to have that mindset in order to overcome these bumps. And that's just one. Ex, that's just one example of my bumbling idiosity. So I've done so many point things. Point being too. is that if I can make silly mistakes like that, then you know anyone can fire. Is my point. <laughs> Absolutely, and I've made so many my, mistakes myself, and all the landmines that I helped other stu or my students step over because. Hey, I stepped on that before. That was bad. Watch out for this. This will probably happen. And they go, oh, good. Yo, thanks for telling me. And then they walk around it. And so I love that you tell that story because as you're thinking about, man, that would literally stop most people in the tracks. Like, oh, this can't work. This was just bad. But no, no, no. If you have that mindset where you're actually going to move forward with it and 
you know the business model is going to work out, especially if you've already been taught by somebody else or you've learned just by by um, being being around some a mentor or taking some courses or something like that. Like you understand the business model and you just made a little mistake. Well, it's that mindset that's going to say, you know what, I'm determined to make this work. And because I'm determined, I'm not going to let this stop me because I know it's going to work. This was just a hiccup. In fact, here's the bad thing or here's what could have been a bad thing. You learned from this process. You've learned a lot from this process. If you would have just stopped then and there, you would have wasted that money and you would not have really learned anything because you would not have implemented that into the future of your investing. Now you've literally learned. I know there was a huge story um, or there was a story a long time ago um, where I can't remember which company is, but a big, big company. So a, an employee of the company, like the CEO, he was working right underneath the CEO. And this guy was working really, really hard. And it turns out he lost the company like a hundred million dollars. And it's a really, really big company, but a hundred million dollars is a lot of money. And he goes to CEO, he apologizes that, you know, this was my mistake and he's expecting to be fired. And the CEO says, that would be a hundred, a hundred million dollar uh, mistake that if I let you go, that's, I lost that hundred million dollars double over. You've learned, you better not let it happen again, but this is something that you've learned from take this mistake and get better, make me that money back. And he turned did and got the money back or built businesses, made the business better so he could pay back or, you know, make the money back. But those mistakes will help us. If you, like, I love the saying, you know, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. If you fall off the horse, you get back up. That's the only way that you're going to get better is if you persevere, you push through it, all the hard times that are going to come because they will come. But once you get past those, you'll have all those scars, those battle scars to prove I've done it and I know how to not get cut all over again. So, man, Michael, you give us so much great insights. I know there is so much more. Like, is there anything else that we should take away from the fire planner? Because I know we got to get it. We need to get that planner because it's literally going to walk us through. If you haven't seen this on YouTube, Michael held up the book. It is thick. It is a very beautifully laid out, well thought out planner to walk you through the process um, if you haven't, I definitely think you should check it out. The link will be in the description for where you can pick it up. And also, Michael, is there anything else that we should really be thinking about in our walk towards fire? Yeah, you know, I think the only other thing is that, you know, I think there's something for everyone, right? There's something obviously for someone that's just brand new to personal finance that can pick it up, really understand what fire is and see if it's a journey that they want to go on. For some people, they may not want to go on it. And that's great. At least it gave them that idea that they know what it is and they can move forward. For other people that are already on the path and on the journey, there's so much more that you may not know. And so I, I really believe that this book will help to fill in some of those gaps. And when you finally get to the point of being able to retire early, guess what? That's a choice and it's a thought process. And there's a whole element of understanding, okay, what am I going to do with my life next? This book actually walks you through that process so that you're very clear on how you want to transition. I think Sometimes people in a traditional sense will retire, right? And all of a sudden they're just like, you know, well, now what? They've lost their sense of purpose. They don't know, you know, what's driving them anymore. And sadly enough, a lot of people will, you know, retire from this earth after they retire because I think intrinsically they don't have anything else to, to drive towards. So I really talk about if you're going to retire early, you need to have something to retire to. You need that greater sense of purpose. And, you know, for Dustin and myself, for us, it's about, you know, building, expanding more and then creating impact. And so, you know, this this fire planner will really take you through that entire process and really give you some of those insights that I wish I had when I first kind of pulled the trigger and was kind of looking around saying, OK, what next? You know, eventually I figured it out. But this will just help to to really accelerate that process. So definitely excited for you guys to come check it out. As Dustin said, I'll link it up in the notes. But if you go to financialalert.com slash planner, you can go there and see the th what the book's about. But also, if you pre-order, there's a form on there where you can enter your information and you'll get a ton of exclusive additional book bonuses um, we're going to be doing a private live Q&A. We're going to do some extra video bonuses, uh, maybe some even some free courses and things of that nature. So there's going to be a ton of different things that I'm going to be giving away to the people that are pre-ordering or the early orders. So definitely go on there, check it out. And I promise you, this is a book, a personal finance book, unlike anything you've seen before. So definitely appreciate the support. And uh, thank you so much, Justin, for having me on. Awesome, man. So financiallyalert.com forward slash planner. So we can get all those bonuses and everything. So 
Man, Michael, and you also have a podcast because now if people are listening on the, on the podcast, what's your podcast that you have? I do. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share that. So Dustin, I also do a podcast and it's called Breakthrough Millionaire. And this podcast is actually dedicated to building that mindset. What does it mean to break through and become that breakthrough millionaire in the sense of how do we break through, find our authentic selves, lean into that and build a life of fulfillment that ultimately creates wealth in all areas of our life, whether that's finance, whether that's spiritual, whether that's physical, I think we want it all, right? And in some senses, I think once you tap into your true calling, your God-given talents, I think that's when life just opens up and it's an explosion of excitement and fun and joy. And so that's what we're out there sharing on that podcast. You've been on the podcast a couple of times and um, we're definitely going to have you back as well. Awesome. Man, Michael, you give us so much great insights. I really appreciate your time. I know everybody's going to get lots of stuff out of it. So it's been great having you all, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate it.